Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Here are the stories we're following today. Oil prices are on the rise once again this morning. Crude is trading at a 10-month high. Earlier, Brent topped $95 a barrel. Now it's past that. Brent's at $95.11. And uh, West Texas Intermediate Crude's up 1.4% on this morning's session at ninety two seventy six. Bloomberg senior energy reporter Stephen Stabzinski tells us the reason behind this move. When you look at the supply cuts from Saudi Arabia, Russia, that's that's really been pushing up prices over the last few months since June. Brent oil, the main benchmark for oil, has has risen 30 percent. And, you know, you saw earlier this month, Saudi Arabia and Russia extended those production cuts one million barrels a day through the end of the year. Uh, without that oil coming into the market, it's uh, helping to drain inventories in some parts of the world. Bloomberg's Steven Stabzinski says this surge in oil is rekindling fears of inflation. And Nathan, the oil rally is igniting a flurry of predictions that $100 is on the horizon. And here's what Chevron CEO Mike Worth had to say when we asked him if the world is headed for triple-digit oil. Sure looks like it. We're certainly moving in that direction. The momentum, you know, supply is tightening. Inventories are, are drawing. These things happen gradually. You can see it building. And so I think, you know, the, the trends would suggest that we're, we're, we're certainly on our way. We're getting close. And Chevron's Mike Worth made the comments in an interview with Bloomberg's Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. Get the full conversation on the Bloomberg Talks podcast feed. Download it wherever you get your podcasts. Well, Karen, we're headed into day five of the United Auto Workers strike against the three Detroit automakers. And the union says it has gotten no new offers from Ford, General Motors or Stellantis. So now UAW President Sean Fain is warning the strike could expand by the end of the week. Noon on Friday, September 22nd is a new deadline. Either the big three get down to business and work with us to make progress in negotiations or more locals will be called on to stand up and go out on strike. UAW President Sean Fain made that announcement on a Facebook video. Ford and GM have announced layoffs of non-striking workers. A source says the union will pay those workers $500 a week. Well, Nathan, another big IPO hits the market today. Instacart starts trading on the NASDAQ. The San Francisco-based grocery delivery company sold 22 million shares for $30 each. Bloomberg IPO reporter Ryan Gould says there was speculation the price could have gone higher. Having had such good momentum this past week with Arm, perhaps, you know, there is some consideration being given to not wanting too much price sensitivity and being constructive with investors. And Bloomberg's Ryan Gould says the $660 million IPO is the fourth largest in the U.S. this year. Well, this morning, Karen, politics are also very much in focus. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky plans to meet Brazilian counterpart Luis Inacio Lula da Silva at the United Nations General Assembly in New York. The meeting will be one of the most anticipated encounters at the assembly. The Brazilian leader has not yet picked sides in the war. Well, also happening at the U.N. today, Nathan, President Biden is scheduled to make remarks before the 78th session of the Assembly. Stay with Bloomberg for full coverage. And Secretary of State Antony Blinken met with China's Vice Premier Han Zheng on the sidelines of the Assembly. The number two official in the Chinese government says China-U.S. relations face a lot of difficulties and challenges. And meanwhile, Karen, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says ending America's trade relationship with China is a no-go. Yellen spoke at a fireside conversation with... With Hillary Clinton. It's in many areas a win-win relationship in the sense that our trade and investment flows produce gains for China and gains for the United States. And much of it is un- uncontroversial, should thrive, and it would really be disastrous to try to decouple from China. Janet Yellen's comments come as relations between the world's two biggest economies remain tense over everything from semiconductors to Taiwan. Well, Nathan, the U.S. is less than two weeks from a government shutdown. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy's plan to slash agency spending and resume border wall construction is already facing pushback from at least 10 hardline conservatives. He can only afford to lose five. Republican Senator Ted Cruz says he does not want to see a shutdown, but he thinks it's likely to happen. And he's pointing the finger at Democrats. Joe Biden and Chuck Schumer both believe politically it is in their best interest to have a shutdown because they believe that in a shutdown that the press will eagerly blame it on Republicans. And I think Biden and Schumer think they get a political benefit from it. 
Texas Senator Ted Cruz spoke with Joe Matthew and Anne-Marie Hordern on Bloomberg's Balance of Power. Catch the show live weekdays, 5 p.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg Television. Finally, Karen, debris has been found from that missing USF-35 fighter jet. Bloomberg's Ed Baxter has the latest. An intense hunt has been underway for the $100 million jet near Williamsburg County, North Carolina. The pilot ejected during a training mission on Sunday. Teams now from the Marines, Navy, Civil Air Patrol, local law enforcement on the search. The F-35 is the most advanced of the U.S. fleet. The Marine Corps has ordered a pause in air operations to review safety and best practices. A statement cited three Class A mishaps in the last six weeks. I'm Ed Baxter, Bloomberg Radio. And it's time now for a look at some of the other stories making news around the world. For that, we're joined by Bloomberg's John Tucker. John, good morning. And good morning, Karen. That deal struck with Iran to release five American prisoners has brought about controversy as well as confusion. Not only did the U.S. agree to to a prisoner swap, they also agreed to release billions in sanctioned money. Republicans, including former Defense Secretary Mark Esper, have lashed out at the deal. Tehran is going to learn from this lesson that there is incentive to taking more Americans wrongfully. The Biden administration insists the unfrozen Iranian assets can only be used for humanitarian purposes. Former New York mayor and Donald Trump personal lawyer Rudy Giuliani now being accused of being a deadbeat. He's being sued by his lawyers. More from Bloomberg's Jeff Bellinger. The law firm that represented Rudy Giuliani sued him for $1.4 million in unpaid fees racked up over the course of various lawsuits and investigations the former New York City mayor has faced, even as he has claimed to be close to broke. Davidoff, Hutcher, and Citron billed Giuliani for $1.57 million, but he has only paid $214,000, the firm said in a complaint filed in New York State Court. Giuliani has broken the retainer agreement he signed with the firm, according to the filing. The latest payment was made September 14th for $10,000. Giuliani faces a slew of civil and criminal complaints, most stemming from his efforts to keep former President Donald Trump in office after he lost the 2020 election. Jeff Bellinger, Bloomberg Radio. It's a new low in diplomatic relations between Canada and India. India rejecting allegations by Prime Minister Justin Trudeau that its government agents were behind the assassination of a prominent Sikh leader in Canada. India has now moved to expel a Canadian diplomat. The Wall Street Journal reports China ousted its foreign minister after an investigation concluded he had an affair and fathered a child while serving as ambassador to the U.S. China stripped Queen Gang of his post in July, just seven months after he started the job, the shortest stint in the role in that nation's history. No explanation was given at the time. Global News, 24 hours a day, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm John Tucker, and this is Bloomberg. Karen. All right, John, thank you. Now get the latest news whenever you want it with Bloomberg News Now. It's the top stories from our global team of reporters at the click of a button. Get Bloomberg News Now on the Bloomberg Business app, Bloomberg.com, and anywhere you get your podcasts. And it's time now for the Bloomberg Sports Update. We bring in John Stashauer. John, good morning. Karen, there were two Monday Night Football games, an NSC South battle in Charlotte, New Orleans, improving to 2-0 for the first time since 2013. Beat the Panthers 20-17. Saints won thanks to their defense. Didn't give up a touchdown until a minute 16 left in the game, and that's the first TD New Orleans has allowed on the season. They sacked Carolina's rookie quarterback Bryce Young four times. They held him to 153 yards passing in Pittsburgh. Steelers and Browns had six turnovers, four in the first quarter, and Pittsburgh had two defensive touchdowns. One came early. Watson awaiting Posix direct snap, and here it is. He wants to throw it. He does, and he throws it up to the third, and it's intercepted on a tip with that football. Alex Highsmith to the goal line. Touchdown Pittsburgh on the first play. A 30-yard interception return by the young man out of Charlotte. Alex Highsmith. Steelers radio fourth quarter. T.J. Watt a fumble return for touchdown, and Pittsburgh beat Cleveland 26-22. Both teams are 1-1. One one. The Browns lost their star running back Nick Chubb to what's being called a significant knee injury. Michigan State says it plans to fire football coach Mel Tucker after the allegations of sexual harassment. Red Sox ended a four-game losing streak 4-2 at Texas. 
The Orioles won 8-7 at Houston, a possible playoff preview. Nationals lost to the White Sox 6-1. The A's shut out by Seattle 5-0. John Stash, our Bloomberg Sports. From coast to coast, from New York to San Francisco, Boston to Washington, D.C., nationwide on Sirius XM, the Bloomberg Business App, and Bloomberg.com. This is Bloomberg Daybreak. Good morning, I'm Nathan Hager. Can consumers withstand a spike in oil prices, and exactly how high will they go? The recent surge in crude costs is raising those questions. Now, Chevron CEO Mike Wirth joined Bloomberg's Alex Steele and Guy Johnson for a conversation on oil supply and robust global demand. They began with the question, will oil reach $100 a barrel? Sure looks like it. We're certainly moving in that direction. Uh, the uh, momentum, uh, you know, supply is tightening. Inventories are, are drawing. These things happen gradually. You can see it building. And so I think the, uh, you know, the, the trends would suggest that we're, we're, we're certainly on our way. We're getting close. What impact do you think 100 bucks a barrel will have on the U.S. economy? What impact will it have on the global economy? Certainly those are higher prices than uh, you know, we, we tend to see out over the long term. And so I think it will have uh, some effect on the economy. But you know, we, we've had relatively higher oil prices here now for, for most of this year and certainly all of last year. The recession that everyone's been talking about hasn't arrived. And, uh, and so I think the underlying uh, drivers of the economy in the U.S. And, and frankly globally remain pretty healthy. So uh, I think it's a drag on the economy, but uh, uh, one that thus far I think the economy has been able to, to tolerate. Do you, have you adjusted your price deck? <laughs> <laughs> Meaning, that's my question, being like, are these higher prices sustainable for the long term? Yeah, we, we take a very long-term view on supply, demand, policy, technology. We haven't changed our long-term price, mm -hmm. uh, but we, we really don't change that very often and, and not in response to what our short-term... And we, we've been in a volatile market really going back to the pandemic when things came down, the recovery, when it was high, the war. Uh, so th this has been a, a period of time where prices have been unpredictable yep. and, and volatile and not what you would call mid-cycle. Mike, if I worked for you and I work for Chevron, would this be my cue to say, Mike, can I have a pay rise, please? I think you're making reference to what's going on in, in different parts of the world. We're seeing organized labor, uh, you know, in uh, many different industries now, uh, kind of assertively uh, step forward and say, look, we, uh, we want to be compensated. We see the inflation in the economy and uh, we've seen companies recover. We've uh, uh, had a very strong pay program last year for our employees. We try to stay very competitive mm -hmm. and, uh, and I would expect we'll continue to do so. So far, cargos have not yet been impacted. You're using some non-union workers, right? Is there a point where that would change? Well, we certainly hope that uh, what we'll see is uh, a negotiated agreement. Uh, others in Australia have reached agreement with these mm -hmm. unions. We've been at the table bargaining in good faith, and, uh, and that's our desired outcome. We do prepare to maintain operations even during an industrial action, and thus far we've been able to successfully do so in Australia. Do you think if I'm sitting here in Europe, I should worry about what's happening here? Is this going to be a problem when we get to winter, do you think, Mike? Well, last winter, Europe came through better than I think most thought, Guy. Now, inventories were high going into the winter because Russian gas had been flowing in. Uh, industrial demand really came off, and then it was a relatively mild winter. We certainly can't count on all of those things happening again, but gas inventories in Europe are pretty, pretty strong right now relative to history. And so I would say Europe is set up uh, much better than it was last year. Uh, the weather is always difficult to predict, but uh, I, I feel like Europe is in, uh, in about as good a place as it could hope to be uh, at this point in time. What are you noticing in China, whether it's LNG or oil demand poll? Well, it's been gradual. It's been slower than people expected it mm -hmm. to be, but it, it is coming back. And, and I think that's one of the reasons why you've seen crude oil prices tightening. Is, is that inventory restocking, do you think, or is that end user demand? It's always a little bit hard to tell. The data okay. out of China isn't exactly uh, as transparent as it is in, in other parts of the world, but I think it's probably uh, indicative of an economy that is, is finding some traction and is, is moving forward. Uh, we're going to see record oil demand this year. And so uh, as long as the global economy stays relatively healthy, demand for these products uh, steadily marches forward. Increasingly, it looks like climate change is going to be litigated. Is litigation the right way of dealing with this? 
No, it's not. Uh, look, this is one of many such actions that, uh, that we've seen over the years. Ironically, um, a number of them um, on, filed on behalf of people who have actually profited from and encouraged energy development. Uh, climate change is a global issue. It calls for a coordinated global policy response, not piecemeal litigation that benefits attorneys and, uh, and politicians. So uh, we, we, will, we do have uh, smart lawyers. We will deal with the, the, the lawsuits. But more importantly, uh, we're working on finding ways to meet today's energy demand with energy that has less carbon intensity and still is affordable and reliable for the economy, even as we're investing in new technology to build a new energy system over time that is inherently lower carbon. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Today, your morning brief on the stories making news from Wall Street to Washington and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed at 6 a.m. Eastern each morning on Apple, Spotify, and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning starting at 5 a.m. Wall Street time on Bloomberg 1130 in New York, Bloomberg 991 in Washington, Bloomberg 1061 in Boston, and Bloomberg 960 in San Francisco. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. Plus, listen coast to coast on the Bloomberg Business app, Sirius XM Channel 119, the iHeartRadio app, and on Bloomberg.com. I'm Nathan Hager. And I'm Karen Moscow. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day right here on Bloomberg Daybreak.